Brown will speak. We will have time for question and answer. I hope we will have quite a lot of time. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, the abolition of slavery in Islam. Uh, somewhat of a controversial subject. Um, I hope that it will also uh, pique your interest. So without further uh, delay, uh, please allow me and please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Brown. This moral crime, 
And it doesn't matter if it was okay at his time or if a lot of people thought it was okay. He is as guilty back then as he would be today of this. And so this is uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm giving this setting is because when we, when we evaluate Muslim answers to the question about the of slavery, the criteria or the standard against which they're evaluated, in, certainly in the U.S. context, is one in which there is no acceptable acceptance. There is, it is not acceptable to accept or indulge slavery in any way. It has to be condemned uh, transhistorically. Transhistorically. Okay. Okay. So first, um, there's a there's a big question, uh, and this question is debated maybe amongst Muslims, but certainly between. Western scholars of Islam and some Muslims. The question is, is Islam, is slavery part of the DNA of Islam? Is, this, is slavery in the DNA of Islam? Okay. Uh, slavery uh, is mentioned in the Quran numerous times. The phrase, what, you're, what you rightfully possess, slaves, especially female slaves. Uh, the option of enslaving prisoners of war is given in the Quran. Um, uh, the, uh, the expiation for sins like breaking oaths, uh, accidental killing, one of the expiations you have to do is, uh, if you have one, is to free a slave. If you don't have one, you can fast or feed poor people. So it's mentioned, it's accepted as a simple fact of, simply a fact of life. And uh, in the Hadiths and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, السلام, you have, I mean, just endless references to slavery, uh, to Hadiths dealing with the laws and how you treat slaves. Uh, in encouraging people to uh, free slaves, uh, dealing with the ins and outs of buying and selling, etc., etc. Uh, so this is, um, it's present in the Islamic tradition from the very beginning. It's assumed to be a fact of life. Um, <coughs> now what this meant for a lot of uh, Western scholars of Islam, whether it's uh, early 19th century, early 19th and 20th century scholars like William Muir in South Asia or uh, Sue Carbonia in the Netherlands, or uh, other scholars, more recent scholars of Western Islam in West Africa, like John Unwin, or John Willis, or Paul Lovejoy, uh, or other scholars like Bernard Lewis, you see the same ideas over and over, which is that Islam, uh, slavery is simply part and parcel of Islam. And as long as there is Islam, as long as people are adhering, adhering to the Quran, uh, Muslims are going to feel the commandment, hear the commandment, and feel the lure of having slavery as part of their lives. So that you really can't sort of strip slavery out of this religion for the simple for the simple reason that God allows it and the Prophet practiced it and the early Muslims practiced it and the Sharia without exception until the 20th century uh, <coughs> validated this as, as a as a normally correct and acceptable practice. It's simply part of life. Okay. So you can't and the idea is Muslims can't go and say it's something God and the Prophet allowed and practice is wrong. The other, um, uh, there's another perspective going on, you see this particularly in, amongst Islamist writers, like for example, Sayyid Qutb, who was executed in 1966, or Ali Shariati in Iran, he was executed by the Shah in 1977, assassinated. Um, the, the, you have the idea that Islam is an emancipatory force. Qutb uh, writes about uh, the early Muslim emissary was sent to the Persian general on the eve of the Muslim conquest of Iran, and uh, the general asks this uh, companion why the Muslims had come. And he says, we've come to free people, free mankind from the slavery of other men, and make them slaves of God alone. And in fact, the phrase that the Quran regularly uses to talk about human beings is, Allah, the slaves of God. The servants of God, which is, by the way, not any different from the New Testament, where what is often translated as servants in the you know modern English is actually doulos in Greek, which is slave. So I mean, this idea of slave and worshiper being idiomatically identical is uh, is a is, is common in the Near Eastern tradition, and you see it in the Quran as you do in the New Testament. Uh, so what people like Ali Shariati and Say, what we talk about is Islam is a force that liberates people from enslavement to idols. It breaks idols, and it makes you—you're not no longer slave to human forces and human desires and uh, 
materialism and capitalism and whatever ism you want to talk about, it makes you a slave of God alone. And that, that is in fact liberating, it liberates you. So the question is, uh, is Islam, is slavery part of the DNA of Islam, or is Islam an emancipatory force? If Islam is an emancipatory force like, say, Qutb and Ali Shariah said it is, why were Muslims neck deep in the trade of, sla trade of slaves and enslavement and having slaves in Islam's religion until the, at least in places like Mauritania, legally until 1982, and illegally until today? And why were Muslim countries some of the, the last countries to agree to uh, prohibit slavery? And why, in their opposition to prohibiting slavery, did they often, in the 19th and early 20th century, cite the fact that we cannot forbid something that God and the Prophet allowed? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the um, Muslim. Uh, Muslims talking about the issue of slavery and abolition of slavery doesn't happen until they encounter Western, essentially Western abolitionism. Uh, that's not unusual because Western people hadn't talked about abolition of slavery until they encountered Western abolition. Right. So that it's, there's a, there's a sort of an idea that, and this is a, part of the way that abolitionism and slavery play a central role in the Western history of in the West history of itself. There's this idea in, in sort of taught in Sunday schools and in schools to this day that Western European Christians are sort of there's a, this spark of of freedom. They love freedom. Like on Star Trek, you know, remember the Marshall Old Star Trek where the humans get captured and they don't want they'd rather die than be in prison and this alien species like, what is this species? They would rather die than be in prison. <laughs> Captain Kirk refuses to be prison. So, you know, Western man wants to be free. And, you know, even back in the Middle Ages, they knew this, and it was sort of, you know, they started to get rid of slavery in Europe in the Middle Ages, and then, then they, yeah, okay, they did a lot of slavery, true, 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 but then they realized it was wrong, and then they went out in the 1700s, 1800s, and they, they fought for the whole world to be free of slavery. And they would drag, they were going to drag the rest of the world in Asia and Africa, and the they were going to drag them by hook or by crook, willing or unwilling, into this new world in which slavery was a thing of the past. And it, so this is a very important idea in the Western self-autobiography, uh, if you will. And, um, but what it ignores is that, in fact, no, essentially nobody in human history, I mean, you can count them. There's about, I've counted three or four people, people prior to the late 1600s, who said that slavery was morally or philosophically or theologically wrong. I mean, in, in the world that I know of. Right? Uh, so whether it's Christians, Christianity, or Christian philosophers, or Greek philosophers, or natural law theologians, or whatever, natural law legal scholars, etc., etc., in Western Europe, nobody questioned the morality of slavery until essentially the, uh, in any appreciable number, until the 1700s. Um, and then, interesting, you know, and not a coincidence, the second that Aristotle, remember Aristotle had said that slavery will exist until looms, you know, looms that like make cloth. Until looms power themselves, you'll have slaves. Guess when, how long slavery lasted until, sure enough, human beings said, hey, you know, we can burn this coal stuff and make steam and we don't need humans and animals to move stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the slavery becomes unnecessary. Uh, there's a lot of debate around this academically, but that, I think, is pretty, the, 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 you know, it's uh, at a, a macro level undeniable. It's not a coincidence that slavery becomes something that you can morally condemn only after it is something that you can actually economically dispense with. Okay, uh, so my, my point here is that the, the Muslims not having sort of an indigenous discourse around in, abolition is not unusual because nobody had a dis indigenous discourse around abolition, and no society in human history that we know of that had slaves, and almost all society, certainly all major civilizations, had slaves. None of them ever abolished or proposed abolishing slavery until the early modern period. This is very important to keep in mind. Okay, um, so what are the Muslim? So when Muslim, the earliest that you see Muslims starting to interact with Western abolitionism is. Surprise, surprise, in South Asia and in India, where Muslims first really 
come into uh, extensive contact with Western Europeans under British rule, uh, where uh, uh, Muslim legal scholars, uh, muftis or law officers, that are, are they, or, as they're called, are working side by side with British judges uh, in Sharia courts under um, the areas of the, the Mughal Empire that Britain, the British East India Company was governing. And then, as you have more kind of company control of India, uh, uh, they're, they're, the British East India Company and the Crown is directly dealing with Islamic law. So it's around the year 1808. In fact, it is the year 1808 that you first have British abolitionist um, uh, officers in India going to Muslim and Hindu legal scholars and saying, okay, what do you guys say about slavery? I want to know. This is an evil way to get rid of it. Tell me what your position is. Um, now, if there, what are the, uh, and then later on, you see this more in the 1840s and 50s as you have in the Ottoman world, it increased British and European diplomatic interaction with the Ottoman Empire and increased diplomatic pressure on the Ottoman Empire. And uh, after 1830, um, when Brit slavery becomes illegal in the British Empire, or most parts of the British Empire, not India, not parts of Africa, but in uh, Britain, uh, uh, there's a lot more pressure from abolition circles and in British foreign policy to ask other power, especially the Ottoman Empire, and uh, Muslims in India, and non-Muslims in India, to, to end uh, the slave trade and the you know, uh, institution of slavery itself. So what are the answers to come up with? So I'm going to go from sort of the, if you want to think about a spectrum from total moral condemnation of slavery, sort of what would be to us the most modern sentiment, to on the other end of the spectrum, just a full-blown, full-blown defense, defense of Islamic slavery. And I want to be—I want to be very clear. When I talk about slavery in this talk, I'm talking about slavery as envisioned in the Sharia. I'm not talking about slavery in the Americas. I'm not talking about slavery as Muslims practice it in Zanzibar or practice it in Indonesia. I'm talking about slavery at least as theoretically conceptualized under the Sharia. Rik is the term in, in, uh, in Islamic law. Rik means. Uh, essentially slavery, where people are um, a property of their own. Okay, so the, the, the strongest response comes from South Asian scholars, especially one named Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who dies in 1898. He uh, is a functionary for the British East India Company and also for the Mughal Empire in its, in its sort of twilight. And uh, in the 1860s, he adopts a, a British lifestyle and he is one, really one of the sort of dynamos of Islamic modernist thought. The idea that Islam can be and should be totally modern um, in order for Muslims and Islam to survive. They have to kind of come to a, a reconciliation with modernity. And what does he mean by modernity? He means British, uh, Protestant, ninth, late 19th century, kind of Sherlock Holmesian modernity. Uh, so what he says is, in the 1870s, he writes in English and also in Urdu, he says that um, Islam actually never allows slavery. It was a, it's, been, it's a big mistake. To, Muslims have, been, have made a huge mistake in this. Uh, they were obviously affected by their cultural environment. In fact, the Quran, uh, although the Quran acknowledges existing slave relationships, that all the verses of the Quran that uh, seem to uh, allow it are in fact abrogated. You may know this term in the concept in Arabic. Nesk nes is when a Quranic verse or a hadith uh, replaces the legal ruling of an earlier Quranic verse. Um, so it, it sort of supersedes the ruling. Uh, so he said that all the verses of the Quran that seem to suggest that Islam, that slavery is louder, are superseded by the verse, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, so he says that in the Quran, Right. So, uh, that when you meet the those people who want to disbelieve, uh, smite their necks, you know, fight them in battle, and then after that, fasten their bonds until you've subdued them, and then fasten the kind of bonds around them, and then after that, either. Let them go for nothing, just let them go, or give them away in ransom. Um, but 
there is no option of slavery. So it's either ransom them off or let them go. So he says this is the this verse replaces everything else. Okay. Uh, he says that slavery is morally wrong, it's against human nature, it's against what God wants. All right. um, the second, uh, th this approach is very vociferous, it's uh, mostly modern in its sens sensibilities, but it's not very, it was not very convincing uh, for many Muslims for the main reason that it, uh, it essentially denied the normal readings of the Quran, it denied all of the records of the life of the Prophet. It denied all of the Islamic tradition <coughs> after that as simply being completely mistaken. So it, it had a huge price tag. It had a huge price tag. It wasn't very convincing. So even to people who share, shared to say that with Khan's sentiment. But what you find is a much, much more common idea, uh, and which is you see developed by another Indian Muslim. Uh, he's a Shia Indian Muslim from Bengal. His name is Sayyid Amir Ali. He died in 1928. He went, he was also studying in England in the, 19th, in the 1870s, and he actually became a high court judge in uh, Bengal, and later on he retired in England. And I think that's important because it shows you both, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan was knighted by Queen Victoria. I don't know if he was directly, personally knighted by her, but he received a knighthood from her. And, uh, and so Sayyid Amir Ali and um, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, I mean, these are proper English, British, English gentleman, uh, as, as kind of English as you can get and still would be uh, uh, Indian. Um, and so what Amir Ali says is, and he's sort of one of the first people to develop this idea, but it's become extremely popular, is that uh, it's to prohibit slavery in the time of the Prophet would have been impossible. It would be simply too much part of economic life and social life. And so, but what God wanted was for Muslims to get rid of slavery as quickly as possible. And that that was what was supposed to happen, but that uh, it hadn't, it, things had gone off the rails. Plans had not gone as they were supposed to. Instead of ending slavery, Muslims had sort of not only not done that, but gotten really involved in slavery and the slave trade and having slaves in their society. By the way, if any of you know about Christian discussions around abolition, this is very similar to uh, supporters of slavery in uh, United States or Britain in the, in the, in the 19th and uh, 18th and 19th centuries would say things to abolitionists like, "If slavery is so bad, why doesn't the Bible prohibit it? Why does the Old Testament allow it? Why does Jesus never say, hey, get rid of slavery? Why does Paul say that slaves should fear their masters as they would fear, obey them as they would obey Christ?' Right? Why does and the answer of abolitionists was similarly." It would have been too difficult. It would have caused too much strife. Uh, but clearly, uh, this is what Jesus wanted was for slavery to be ended as soon as possible. Okay. Um, there's a number of other people there. Uh, Western, uh, British, especially, sorry, Egyptian, elite Egyptians who were studying in Europe and France and England in, in the 1880s and 1890s come with similar ideas. They start writing in English and French and Arabic about these this approach to Abolition. Okay. Um, now, uh, kind of as a subset of this approach, you see uh, among some Muslim scholars an attempt to kind of imagine this alternative history of slavery in Islamic civilization. That to sort of imagine that, you know, just to, to bring out this strain of emancipation. That this, this idea that slavery was supposed to be ended immediately, uh, to kind of um, to imagine, to follow, this, to follow this, this thread through Islamic history, and to, to highlight this, and to have this be kind of the, the Islamic history that Muslims should, should understand and, and treasure and promote. Well, one of them is a Senegalese scholar named Musa Kamara, who dies in 1945. And, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, what these scholars point to. Uh, is the fact that um, the Quran in, indeed did promote the uh, freeing of slaves. Uh, the Quran has some un historically unprecedented rules on it. For example, it makes uh, slave, freeing slaves as an expiation for certain sins or crimes you commit. It gives part of the zakat 
tax to freeing slaves. Uh, it, it encourages what's called mukataba. Mukataba is gradual self-purchase, where a slave will agree with their master that, okay, I'm going to buy my, my own freedom on installments from you. Uh, and in the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, you see just uh, maybe endless, I mean, in terms of authentic hadiths, dozens, in terms of inauthentic hadiths, probably hundreds of hadiths, uh, urging Muslims to free their slaves, urging Muslims to treat their slaves well, and uh, focusing on the, the rewards in the afterlife, the tremendous rewards that a, per, um, a, a master gets or a mistress gets when they, on the, in the afterlife, were free and slave. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and they sort of follow this emancipatory thread and imagine a, an alternative history of Islam, where Islam really is this force of emancipation. And that now, in the modern period, yes, Europeans are the ones who um, sort of suggested abolition, but, but in fact, this was really Muslim's destiny. This was Islam's destiny in its DNA was actually to be a force of emancipation. And it, things had simply those had gone off the rails. Okay. Um, I will talk about this later. Okay. The third approach <coughs> is the idea that uh, emancipation is an aim of the Sharia. It's an aim of the Sharia. And the, the term that would be used in Arabic was maqsid. Is it? Maqsid, one of the aims of the Sharia. Uh, what's the difference between this and the previous option? Big difference. The previous option I gave you says is God wanted slavery to be ended as soon as possible, but Muslim didn't, Muslims didn't follow that command. So slavery in Islamic civilization was wrong because Muslims didn't, uh, what they were supposed to do was end it. And they were supposed to have ended it like within decades of the death of the Prophet. What this third option says is, no, um, there was nothing wrong with slavery in Islamic civilization because uh, emancipation is the aim of the Sharia. Emancipation is different from abolition. Emancipation simply means you free slaves. And in fact, you might go out and say, I want to get as many slaves as I can so that I can free lots of slaves. Can you, can you imagine all the rewards I'm going to get for freeing slaves, and I'm going to go get a bunch of Slavs from steppes of Russia and bring them back, and I'm going to introduce them to Islam. They're going to learn about Islam. They're going to find happiness in this life and the next life, and then I'm going to free them. They're going to be free people in good standing, like everybody else, and I'm going to get the reward for freeing them. Uh, but what this argument says in the context of abolition is now that um, slavery is no longer economically necessary, the culmination of God's aim of emancipation is simply to maximize emancipation and get rid of slavery as a phenomenon. It's sort of the ultimate emancipation, the ultimate movement of emancipation. Uh, this is a idea that is first developed by people like Rashid Ridla, the famous, I, you all have a ha handout, you should have information about these people and their names and things like that. So I don't have to write them down for Rashid Ridla, who's a scholar from you know, Syria, Lebanon, he spent a lot of time in Egypt, he's extremely sort of scholar, activist, one of these people with endless energy, constantly writing, constantly having different founding institutions and schools and journals, and uh, very anti-colonial. So for him, kind of a, str a strong modern Islam with an authentic Islam, but also an Islam that would be able to resist the West, intellectually and politically and everything. Uh, and it, you see it articulated, with, especially by a famous Tunisian scholar named Mohammed Tahir bin Ashur. He's a judge in the uh, courts in Tunisia, and he dies in 1973. Very interesting figure. I'll talk to him, I'm sure he wrote a famous tafsir of the court. Um, I should, uh, as a sort of a subset of this, I would bring your attention to a progressive Islam. I don't know if you've followed this stuff, but especially in, in uh, the United States and Western Europe, uh, especially after 9 11, a lot of uh, a number of Muslim intellectuals, especially uh, university professors, who were Muslim, um, kind of continued the Islamic modernist idea of someone like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan or um, Muhammad Abdu, but uh, in a kind of early 21st century, post 9-11 context, uh, where uh, things like human rights, gender equity, uh, 
uh, gender justice, LGBT rights, these become moral sort of fixed points of inquiry that are accepted as axiomatically true, and Islam has to be adjusted to accept these things. So gender equity, gender justice, LGBT rights. And uh, um, you can, if you want to read a good book on this, you can read uh, Adis uh, Juderia, who's um, actually is in Australia. So I think that's actually still pretty far. I remember my sister said once that she went from, she was in Malaysia and she wanted to go to Australia. She thought it was like a weekend trip, but it was, the flight was like nine hours or something, because Americans think everything in that part of the world is like right next to one another. So anyway, he's relatively close to here. But uh, he's written a book called, I think, The Mandate of Progressive Islam, which is a good uh, summary of this. Now, the difference between this and the previous option I gave, or the, sort of the, the idea of sh emancipation as an aim, or abolition as the aim of the Sharia, is that the abolition as the aim of the Sharia argument is phrased entirely within the language of Islamic law and Islamic jurisprudence. It's a 100% authentic argument. It does not question the validity or the correctness of the Islamic legal tradition in its traditional form. It simply says that the trajectory of that tradition in the modern period is slavery. Whereas the progressive Muslim argument it is not rooted in that Islamic legal tradition. It goes back to what it sort of a selective reading. Uh, I may be you know, betraying my own opinion of this, but I think I would argue this is inevitable. Uh, and I would challenge the ability of its advocates to deny this. But it, it is a very selective reading of the, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Uh, and its moral source and its moral guideposts are not the Qur'an and the Sunnah as understood by Islamic tradition, but as read through these axiomatic values of uh, equal rights, gender equity, um, uh, LGBT rights, things like that, democracy, uh, social justice. All right. Um, next page. Getting, getting close to, well, actually, I'm not close to being done, but we're getting definitely along the path. We're moving down the path, specifically. That was option number, three. option number four. Option number four. If you can't do it right, you can't do it at all. Now, this is so. This approach is innovated by a figure named Ahmed Bey. Ahmed Bey is the Ottoman governor of Tunis in, in the mid 19th century. Now, Tunis was uh, part of the Ottoman Empire nominally, but had a, a significant amount of political autonomy, and it was a major point of the slave trade from bringing slaves from Africa up through the Sahara and then selling them into the Ottoman Mediterranean. So uh, in 1846, the British, uh, you know, the British were, French were coming from one side, from Algeria, which had occupied in 1830, the Ottomans were trying to centralize and increase control over their peripheral areas like Tunis, and um, Tunis, by the way, is basically modern Tunisia. and. Uh, in the midst of all this, what does Ahmed Bey try to do? He says, well, maybe we can get some support from the British. And the British governor comes to him one day in the early 1840s and says, you know, slavery is problematic for us. We'd like you to try and end the slave trade. And Ahmed Bey says, I'll do you one better. I'll ban slavery. And in 1846, he issues a decree. It's a and he says, uh, from now on, there are, no one can be a slave in Tunis, and everybody who's born is born free. But what's his argument? His argument is, uh, he doesn't. He makes an Islamically sound argument. He says, um, there's a, there are rules for slavery in Islam. You cannot, you cannot enslave Muslims. If you find someone, if you go to a village in Africa and you grab 20 people, and one of them says, hey, I'm Muslim. The burden of proof is on you, the slave trader, to prove that they're not telling the truth. All they have to do is say they're Muslim, and they, they enjoy the, the presumption of truth in this case. Um, you cannot enslave Muslims. And what he says is, a lot of the people who are being grabbed on these raids, or by slave dealers, are actually Muslim. Or they might be Muslim, there's a strong chance they're Muslim. And in addition, there are rules for how you treat slaves. You have to clothe them appropriately, feed them appropriately, treat them with respect, not overburden them, not treat them harshly, not punish them with severe physical chastisement, etc., etc. And uh, people are not following these rules in our, uh, in our uh, state. And uh, because people are not following these rules properly, I am, it's like, you know, if you can't 
uh, have a coffee shop, a student coffee shop that absorbs all the hygiene rules of the university that you can't have a student run coffee shop. Maybe I eat. The student coffee shop above our office was not following the rules and like all this milk became rotten in the pipes and made the whole building stink for weeks. So I think I'm very sensitive about the student run coffee shop issue. So these students, so you can't, if you can't do it right, you can't do it at all. That was his argument. And he also said, there's also significant maslaha or common good in ending slavery because it allows us, we don't have, we won't have Muslim slaves running to foreign European consulates and seeking freedom there and kind of making us look bad and becoming and allowing Western powers to <coughs> blame Islam for uh, allowing slavery and the slave trade. Uh, and this is, by the way, the argument that's in, used by the Ottoman Sultan in 1847 to close the slave market in, in, in Istanbul. Uh, and my, my uh, parents-in-law, they live in Turkey, and they sent me a picture. They said, here we are, we're in the old slave market. And they sent me a picture of that. So that it still exists, but it's like now it's restaurants and like, you know, that shops. And then, by the way, in 18, 1962, when uh, Saudi Arabia prohibited slavery, this was the same argument they used. So this is a, an argument that's used, uh, that has been repeated by other uh, Muslim states. Okay. Option number five. We've done four options. Now option number five. I'm sorry that I, I'm talking about this. I've just been researching this a lot, so it's hard for me to, to treat this as like, it's, for me it's very clinical. Um, but I'm also a scholar. I'm not, this isn't like a therapy session, so I'm not to, okay. So, this, option number five is, um, the Sharia still applies, but circumstances have changed. Circumstances have changed. This, we see this idea develop, this is very early on, in the 1880s, by figures like Muhammad Abdu in Egypt. Muhammad Abdu is a very important, along with Sister State Ahmed Khan, Muhammad Abdu is sort of like the, the twin epicenters of Islamic modernist thought. He ran in South Asia, one in Egypt. Muhammad Abdu was the Mufti of Egypt, he dies in 1905. Uh, you see some other examples of it from uh, uh, Muslim scholars in Morocco and Algeria in the late 19th century. And what this argument says is, look, um, <clears throat> the way that uh, Muslims get slaves, the only, the only way that Muslims can enslave people, the only way that anybody can be enslaved in Islamic law, anybody at all, is of Muslims beat non-Muslims non outside of the abode of Islam. So they go and they raid the Byzantines or they raid some group of Slavs or uh, non-Muslims in Africa or India or something like that. And they take the prisoners and they have the option of enslaving those prisoners. So you have to have jihad, legitimate jihad, you have to have it done by a legitimate Muslim ruler or state. And uh, in the late 19th century, Muhammad Abdu and others argue that is not the case. That in fact, now either everybody is, either you're dealing with populations who are Muslim in India or Africa, or you are in, have treaties with countries, or that you're allies, or that you're colonial masters, or something like that. But either way, you're not engaging in legitimate jihad. And therefore, you can't get prisoners. And therefore, there's no source for slaves. And so, kind of, this, this institution is just going to cease to exist uh, because there's no longer any source for slaves. Um, I'm trying to think if I should give. Okay, I'll, I'll worry about it. So, um, in addition, there's sort of another subset of this argument which says slavery was never valued or approved of morally by the God of Prophets. Oh, this was simply part of life at the time. This was like the rules of war. You know, if your enemies attacked you and they captured you, they would enslave you. And if you attacked them and captured them, you would enslave them. Uh, but if, if that's no longer how people prosecute war, if now you have multilateral treaties like the treaties of the Hague in the late 19th century or a Geneva Convention or something like that, uh, that, that detail how you should treat prisoners of war, that slavery is not uh, an option anymore. Um, it's been taken off the table. In addition, what this approach says is that, and this goes back to the Quran, it goes back to Islamic law by agreement of all the different schools of law, is that it's ultimately up to the Muslim's ruler, the Muslim imam, 
or what other country or state you're talking about, to decide what to do with prisoners. So this choice of ransoming or freeing or whatever or keeping them as slaves, it's up to the ruler. And if, he, if the ruler says, I don't, we, we, it is in our best interest or we have an agreement or et cetera, et cetera, we don't, we can, he can say, there's no more slaves. We will no longer enslave people. So the circumstances have changed. But this is uh, what becomes a major approach to this issue, especially amongst more conservative scholars. Let's say like Yusuf al-Qaradawi, who's an Egyptian resident of Qatar, or big Saudi ulama like uh, Salih Fawzan or Abdul Aziz Fawzan, or um, the prominent Syrian scholar Muhammad Sayyid Ramadan al who died in 2013. Um, and in fact, what this approach would also say is that there has been consensus of Muslim scholars, the Jama'a, there's consensus of Muslim scholars, that this is the way that Muslims should deal with slavery, and therefore, uh, if somebody comes along with ISIS or something and wants to restart slavery, that they're vi violating the consensus of Muslim scholars, they shouldn't, they shouldn't do it. Okay. Option number six, second to last option, almost done. Option number six. How much more time are we going to talk for? 40 minutes? Or like, you're like, almost done. Um, <clears throat> option number six is, um, there's no reason to talk about this. Muslims don't have to come up with an option for getting, for a, a solution for getting into slavery because slavery doesn't exist anymore, legally, as of, you know, 1926 when the Convention to Ban Slavery signed a 1957 uh, convention to ban other forms of uh, slavery-like practices. Um, slavery doesn't exist anymore, so it's, you know, it's like, Talking about uh, if you have, you know, you lose a hand in an accident, you no longer have to wash your hand as part of your ablution. It's called the habit, the, the habit, the head. The locus of the ruling is no longer there. It's simply, it's a moot point. It's a moot point. Um, another kind of aspect of this argument is the, even more cynical, if you will, which is uh, that slavery is very bad PR. So when um, during the 1990s, when there was a war, genocide against Bosnian Muslims, a lot of Muslims from around the world go to fight against the Serbian and Croatian forces in Bosnia. Uh, some of them asked, sent a question to the great Saudi scholar, uh, Ibn Al-Faini. Ibn died in 2001. Yeah, 2001. They asked him, look, this is jihad, right? We're fighting against these people who are non-Muslims who are literally trying to eliminate Muslims and Islam in, South, in, in the Balkans. Uh, surely this is as a legitimate defense of the jihad. Um, and we've, if we capture Serb or Croatian men or women, can we enslave them? What Ibn Uthaymin says is, legally you can, but you don't do it because it's disastrous PR. I mean, you're, you're dependent on Western support, on international support, international sympathy, and if you start enslaving these people, then that's going to happen. Uh, and, and so even some people, let's say Mauritanian scholars like um, uh, who are who, who, who believe that slavery is acceptable in Islamic law, they'll still say that you know you can't do it because the government has prohibited. And they, they, you know this is what so the people don't know this, but Sunni Islam is extremely politically quietist in its sort of mainstream form, it's very politically quietist. So the government comes along and says there's no more slaves. Even if you think they're wrong, your job as a Muslim scholar is to say, yes sir, uh, no more slave, that's fine. And so even Mauritanians and Mauritanian scholars who don't agree with the government's ban on slavery uh, still support that, uh, enforce that ban, and don't allow, would not see slavery as legal in Mauritania. Finally, the last option is uh, not a rejection of slavery at all, and not a support of abolition at all. It's actually a defense of slavery in Islamic law, and says that um, this is an entirely legitimate part of the Sharia. This is uh, validated by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And there's all sorts of Islamic legal rulings that take slavery as, a, uh, as, a, as an assumption that exists. So if, you, if the Quran says that if you violate an oath, that you should either free a slave, violate certain kinds of oath, you should either free a slave or uh, uh, feed uh, 60 poor people or fast for two consecutive months. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a slave free. The Quran is assuming that that's an acceptable option. 
and a good example of this is uh, the Syrian Tel Aviv scholar Mohammed Nasser Dina Al Dani, he dies in 1999, and uh, he, you know, it's very interesting. This is all this is reported on. You can go and listen to this on YouTube if you want. He says, you know, where do you get this idea that abolition is sort of a menu option in the Islamic tradition? This is where did you get this idea? This is just a Western idea. This is from non-Muslim. This is from Kufar. And why the heck are you listening to that? Uh, all these Muslims who, Muslim rulers who barely are Muslim themselves, who don't apply the Sharia, and they all want to go and fulfill this UN agreement or that UN agreement against slavery. And why, why are you listening to these? And people are brainwashed. So they're brainwashed into hating their own legal, their own law. Okay. So, those are the options. Everybody get it? So now I'm going to very quickly want kind of evaluate these options that tell you. Sort of carpet salesman or something like that. These are the, I'm going to try and tell you the you know, strengths and weaknesses or costs and benefits of these approaches. So the, the first one, which is that Islam had never allowed slavery. In fact, it had made it clear that it was supposed to be prohibited. <coughs> the cost here is the entire Islamic intellectual tradition, because it's all wrong. All readings of the Quran. All the historical details of the life of the Prophet and the fact that the companions had slaves, took slaves in common, the fact that the Prophet had concubines, the fact that, and then the entirety of the Islamic legal and theological and social tradition after that, it's all wrong, 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 wrong. It's all misreading. That's a, that's a high uh, cost. The other problem with this is it doesn't actually get, it doesn't actually meet that criteria, that those criteria that I put at the beginning. Because God doesn't say slavery is wrong. The prophet doesn't say slavery is wrong. In fact, they accept the, the present, it, they grandfather in, according to this theory, the existing slave relationships. So in order to meet the modern kind of ethical demand of absolute condemnation of slavery, God and the prophet would have to have said, verily slavery is totally wrong. Go forth and free every slave immediately, and wash your hands of this filthy act, this filthy crime. But that's not what happens even according to this approach. So, very high cost, and at least from my perspective, doesn't meet that moral uh, uh, bar that the, that the modern abolitionist consensus would place. The second approach, which is um, God and the Prophet wanted to they wanted slavery to be ended, but it was impossible at the time, but it should have been done as soon as possible. And the Muslims got that wrong. They, they, didn't, they didn't go down that path. In fact, they went down the opposite path. The problem there, the cost is, again, you lose the Islamic tradition. If you think about tradition here in the Catholic sense of traditio, like the, the corpus, the, the Torah, the, the heritage of Islamic law and theology is all misguided on the issue of slavery. And that's sort of this corruption inside. I mean, every area of Islamic law is permeated by slavery because for every issue, whether it's prayer or fasting or buying or selling or bearing witness or whatever, there's rule, There's the question of what is the ruling for a free person or a slave? And it may be the same ruling, it may be a different ruling, but it's always part of the discussion. Uh, the other argument here is kind of the same argument that, that supporters of slavery in the, in the West and the Christian West use against abolitionists was Wait a second. So you're telling me Jesus, the Son of God, right? God on earth, the guy who overturned the money ta the, the tables of the money changers in the temple, the guy who got crucified because he had such crazy new ideas, he didn't have the courage to just say, by the way, slavery is wrong, because it would have been too disruptive, as if Christianity was afraid of disrupting things. As if the Prophet Muhammad was afraid to go into the Kaaba when he took Mecca and bash and destroy all the idols. As if Islam didn't end idolatry completely in the Arabian Peninsula. As if Islam didn't prohibit alcohol. As if Islam didn't prohibit polytheism and, and burying infants and any number of other uh, reprehensible social practices. The least God or the Prophet could have done is said, Slavery is wrong, get rid of it as soon as you can, but he didn't say that. It's interesting that in the U.S., in the context of the U.S., 
some Christian theologians say uh, it's not like getting rid of slavery in the U.S. had no cost. It caused the Civil War. But I mean, it, it wasn't like getting rid of slavery in the U.S. was easy either in the, in the 19th century, almost 2,000 years after. So uh, the argument, here, the problem with this argument is, one, it has a fairly high cost, and two, it, it asks this question of why, how, why didn't God, why did, if, if slavery is inherently, grossly, morally evil in and of itself, universally, across time and space, how could God have allowed it, even for 20, 30 years, even for a, two, two or three generations? How could the prophet have allowed it? How could the prophet have engaged in it? Option number three. In my opinion, this is without a doubt the correct option. I mean, this is a correct option. Maybe there's more, but this is... I don't think it's possible to say that option number three is wrong. What I mean is that there's no reading, there's no conceivable reading of the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet that does not see them as obsessed with emancipation. In a, in a way that's unprecedented in any other tradition, philosophical or religious tradition, that I know of. Uh, they are, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet are obsessed to the point of absurdity with emancipation. To the point that property rights can be violated, due process can be violated, assumption of, of intent in contracts and statements can be violated. All these things don't matter. Uh, if I go and I, if, if James is my slave, and I say, uh, okay, uh, slave James, uh, after you're done cleaning up this room, uh, you'll be free. You're free to do whatever you want. <coughs> Boom! He's free because I used the word free, even though I didn't mean that. If I run into him on the street and I say, "Oh, ass if you hurt," like it's a like good, my good man. But I say, "Free man." Boom! It's even I didn't know it was him. I thought it was another guy. He's free, mm. right? If it's a joke, he's free. So uh, <clears throat> even if you were to say. That the Quran was like a sort of ultra revisionist historian and say the Quran was actually compiled in the early 8th century, 800s by confused Muslims who were obsessed with Syriac Christianity and cobbled together the Quran from Syriac liturgical texts. And the whole life of the Prophet is totally made up out of whole cloth, and Islam started in the Negev desert in the 9th century or something like that. You'd still have the fact that whatever this thing that Muslims made up, the Quran and the Sunnah, is still obsessed with emancipation. So there's no reading of the Islamic tradition in its scriptural uh, origins, it does not see this uh, emancipation as a major aim of the Sharia. Okay. Now, you could debate whether or not abolition is a consummation of that aim, but the aim itself is not debated. It's not debatable, in my opinion. What's the, the cost? So there's, it, this, this, this answer is, it's 100% authentic. It draws from and is built on the historical tradition of Islamic law and theology. It doesn't question anything. It draws from it. Where's, what's the, the, the downside or the failings? Is you don't, you cannot condemn the pre-modern, the sort of pre-abolition era tradition of Islam. You can't say Muslims were wrong to have slaves. You could say they might have practiced slavery in the wrong way, they might have done this wrong, they might have done that wrong. But the theory, the idea, the existence of the phenomenon is not in and of itself evil. Because God allowed it and the Prophet allowed it. And by the way, even their arguments for prohibition of Islam are entirely drawn from the Islamic tradition because the Muslim ruler can restrict things that are allowed by God and the Prophet if there is some uh, Muslim, some common good. So, uh, you know, for example, God and the Prophet never restrict the speed at which you can drive your camel, ride your camel, or drive your car, right? But as the ruler, I can say, you know what? Everybody, we're in Hong Kong, everybody drives their camel on the left side of the road, maximum 30 miles an hour. You guys use miles an hour? <laughs> kilometers? Okay, whatever, 30 miles, 50 kilometers an hour or something like that. I've restricted things, that you're, I've restricted your rights as Muslims. God never said, you can't. The Prophet never prohibited this, but I'm administratively prohibiting this for our common good. Okay, option number four. Remember, this was, if you can't do it right, you can't do it at all. The problem with this is, it's not condemning slavery in and of itself. It's only saying slavery is wrong if you don't do it correctly. 
you don't do it according to Islamic law. This might not be the case in Hong Kong, but go to an American cocktail party and argue that slavery is okay as long as you do it right and see how long you stay at the party. <laughs> right, see how, until you're escorted out. Um, similar with number five. Uh, same Sharia, but circumstances have changed. Are you telling me that slavery was okay during those previous situations? But now it's just wrong because we happen to have these treaties. By the way, and some of the people who advocate this, like al Bulti and Yusuf al Khaladawi, say if situations change, Muslims might in fact again find themselves legally, morally acceptably engaging in practice of Islam. I like the example of Mad Max. You know, imagine we're in like a Mad Max situation. You and I are driving the like a war wagon. We've got appropriate face paint on, everything like that. And we're talking about I even her back. In the, late, in the early 21st century, we're talking about uh, human rights and all this stuff. That was really funny. Now, the true face of humanity has once again been bared, and we have you know all sorts of you know we're slaughtering people here and killing babies there and having slaves. And at least we're as Muslims, we're doing it according to the laws of the Sharia. So that that's in fact possible. So you don't have a trans historical universal condemnation. Um, similarly, because it's a moot point and bad PR. <coughs> Sorry, you're saying that slavery, Muslims can get rid of slavery just because Europeans have already done it, we don't have to deal with it anymore. There's no, there's not even a, there's not even a, a, an atom of moral condemnation there or disapproval at all. It just, no, we don't have it anymore. Or bad PR, I don't have to explain to you the problem with that. And finally, the, the defense, the sort of full-on regular defense of slavery in the Sharia is not in any way uh, acceptance of any argument for the Okay. That's, uh, those are the different options, the upsides, the, the costs, the benefits, the problems, according to our moral expectations, the moral expectations of the global abolitionist consensus, and I'll be happy to answer your question as soon as you comment. Thank you. So I think it's 
very useful. And this research, this is very good research. I think that, is this part of the new book? This is cut and pasted from the, uh, it's an inset. It'll be like an inset in one of the chapters. The chapter on abolition and slavery, I just cut and pasted from the Word document. So you're getting a pre-selection or whatever, preview. No, I, I would not uh, take the, a lot of your time, but I, but I uh, just want to say that this is very useful. Thank you. It's uh, good. To, I'm glad to know. I was, I kind of, I felt uh, you know, I had to have something like that in there because it's sort of otherwise it's almost impossible. You get so many dates and places, and it, it's hard to keep track of this thing. Uh, but but the one uh, follows the, the, the geography. Yeah. Uh, and the, of colonization and colonization and modernization, I think all of that has to do with slavery. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, this is very, very useful. Plus, uh, your analytical presentation, I think that makes it uh, really very good. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, so, my question where, is... Where, 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 what's your name? Where are you from? Yeah, my, my name's... My name's uh, Daniel Pasco. I'm actually a law professor at uh, one of the other universities in Hong Kong, City University. Where are you from? I'm from Australia. Ah, I knew it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you mentioned the uh, in in the in the early years of the 21st century the, the the mandate of progressive Islam, right? So, so I wonder, without going down that particular track, what are the lessons with this kind of analysis, this kind of textual uh, uh, analysis? For other criminal justice issues and other international law issues, like in particular the death penalty and torture. Okay, that's a great, great, uh, great question. Should we take two more? Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions right now? Uh, yes, please. Uh, oh, sure. uh, okay. Um, uh, right. So um, I uh, I was very struck um, not only by um, Sherkonetsk majority, uh, but also by the sort of uh, gesture made for the. Um, the movement you made at the beginning where you said, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking exclusively uh, from a kind of internalist perspective uh, using the measure of uh, the Islamic legal concepts of slavery and freedom. Well, so I said that the external criteria I'm using is the kind of what I call the global <laughs> abolitionist consensus. Okay, sure. But sure. internal, when I talk about slavery, I talk about slavery is, as the Sharia understands it. Okay, okay. And, then, and there's obviously a lot of discussions uh, about whether uh, Western concepts of slavery and freedom are unique in different ways from other mm -hmm. uh, 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 traditions, and whether the kind of neo-Roman based new tradition of Orlando Patterson and stuff mm -hmm. uh, is really significantly different um, um, from those in other um, from those in other traditions. Um, so, um, so, so I'm wondering whether this kind of let's say um, bumping up of concepts. Uh, plays a part in your story um, when we say um, when uh, when we say slavery, we're really thinking of a kind of neo-Roman idea. Um, is that uh, uh, is that what's really meant? Did people see seem to be the same? Whether were, were, uh, were there debates? People say no, actually, our our concept is slightly different. Um, yeah. Orlando Patterson suggests that. Uh, there's much less of a binary in non-Western traditions between slavery and freedom, where uh, whereas there's kind of a ladder of different statuses of various sorts. So I'm wondering where this fits into your Yeah, story. those are great questions. Those are complicated questions, but uh, excellent. They kind of deal with a bunch of different issues. I'll try um, and get to those. And then the young lady here. Um, so I, I was considering whether I should uh, add this in or not, but adding on to what you mentioned, the question mentioned about um, the abolition of slavery then relating to other um, could you call them, um, punishments of sorts of you know death penalty etc. In the Sharia, I cannot attribute this to Islam right now, but there is a view that you know there is no concept of imprisonment in Islam. It, slavery is sort of an alternative to that. Um, mm -hmm. The view does exist, but unfortunately, I can't. Imprisonment say. of prisoners of war. Yes. Um, Not criminals. Yeah, of course. Okay. But um, so slavery is sometimes taken as you know it's the better alternative than putting someone somewhere useless. Yeah. So um, so 
how do we go about those concepts? Yeah, uh, okay, great question. So first I'll, uh, uh, about the progressive issue. So the thing about the problem, the problem that everybody has, and this is Christian tradition has this, Jewish, every tradition has this. If you have a scripture that comes from the past, or you have some kind of authoritative source in the past, and that authoritative source at any point affirmed the validity of slavery, it doesn't matter how much you talk about abrogation or replacement or progress or whatever, that's easy, or that's not easy. That's, that's fine. But you have to explain how God or this wise person or this prophet or whoever, how they ever allowed this. Because the point is that um, if slavery is a trans-historical, universal, and intrinsic moral evil, then it was as evil in the Old Testament as it, was in the, as it would have been in the New Testament, as it would have been in the 1500s, as it, as it is today. And this is a point that um, supporters of slavery in Britain and the U.S. use. They say, ask abolitionists, say, listen, if this is so bad, why did God ever allow it? And the, only, the ultimately the only response, the only honest response, and this is the response that a lot of Christians came to, a lot of Christian theologians and schools of thought, including in a lot of ways the Catholic Church, is that the way you deal with it is you say that the Old Testament was is not the Word of God. It is not an intact, direct communication of God. It is a human product of humans um, sort of pondering on the message of God. So you have to essentially desacralize Scripture if you're going to have a trans-historical universe of condemnations. Or you have to say that slavery <coughs> back then isn't that bad, it wasn't like our slavery in America or something like that. The problem is then you're in this, there's good slavery and bad slavery, which is unacceptable in the abolitionist discourse. Um, now, so the prog progressives have that same problem. Right? So they, can, they, have, they have new arguments for how we can think about progress in Islam tradition, but they can't deal with the existence of it. Eventually, they would also have to say that the Quran is not really the word of God, and the prophet was not really a moral exemplar in the way that Muslims have understood these to be the case. Uh, uh, they, um, on other issues, so what this, and, and one of the progressive Muslim scholars who's written about slavery a lot, a woman named Tisha Al, who's a professor at Boston University, she says that, she doesn't deal with it extensively about the issue of abolition, what she says is that um, sometimes you have to depart from the text of the Quran in order to fulfill the mandate of justice in the so what, what drives the progressive school of thought is the idea that there's this sort of destiny of justice and equality and dignity, especially human dignity. And that, in fact, that requires Muslims to, uh, in a way, break free of the shackles of the Sharia, the shackles of scripture, uh, the shackles of historical precedent of the prophet, because it's that mandate of justice and dignity that, that drives them, that drives us. Um, with, when you, when, if that's, once you've made that argument, you're essentially free to embrace whatever the progressive agenda is of the day. So if it's uh, LGBT rights, it's that. If it's uh, social justice, it's that. If it's equality of, other, of all religions, it's that. If it's transgender rights, it's that. Uh, because you're no, you're no longer subject to the restrictions. And so what happens with, with this happened actually in the progressive Muslim movement in the U.S. and North America in the early 20th century, in the early uh, 21st century, is that it fragmented because there were some people who were just you know, they're like, no, there's still some rules in Islam we have to follow, and other people were like, no, you know, once you break out of this system and you're going by these kind of abstract and amorphous notions of justice and equality and dignity, um, you're going to have a, essentially a un unchained discourse, which it doesn't, it's no longer part of a tradition or it, the. Participants in it will no longer be part of that tradition, some of them. Uh, the question about, uh, well, there's a lot in that question, but what, so there's one of the, no, sorry, the whole first chapter of my book is about this idea of can we even talk about slavery as in one thing in human history? Um, because if, so there's some, one school of thought in slavery studies says, especially with anthropologists like Suzanne Myers would say like, 
everything has to be contextualized. To try and come up with some definition of slavery that applies everywhere, it's just it's just useless. It's a waste of time. It's a semantic waste of time. Just deal with whatever society you're talking about and discuss it. Um, and the other, the majority school would say, no, no, there is a trans-historical reality called slavery. Um, it, it's incredibly diverse, but we can sit down and come up with definitions for it. We should try and come up with a definition for it. Uh, the problem is those definitions don't work for everything that we in the global West want to call slavery, and that exclude things that we don't want to call slavery. In the end, in my opinion, it's a projection. We end up projecting and looking at things that look like slavery to us, and we call it, and that we disapprove of, and other things that maybe in our own society we have, we don't want to call slavery, we don't want to label it as such. Um, now, what's interesting is that in the, that's not true in the Islamic tradition, in the sense that you can have a discussion of slavery in the West and slavery in the Islamic tradition because the, Islam is a Western tradition. I mean, in the sense that Islam comes out of the late antique Near East of the Semitic and Greco-Roman world, which is exactly, you know, that's two main major sources of Western tradition. And especially if you look at slavery law in the Sharia, it is, so th there's not very much Quranic material on the laws of slavery. Um, a lot of the stuff that it assumes as existing are actually features of the post-Roman law in the Near East. And there's actually not that much material from the Prophet on issues of slavery in terms of law, like how you buy and sell. And so actually, huge swaths of the Sharia slavery law are in fact borrowing from existing traditions which are essentially, you know, kind of Semitic Jewish law, Roman law. So for example, in Islamic law, slavery is goes to the mother. So if, if I, I'm not losing myself, <laughs> if I married a slave woman, uh, the, my child would be a slave owned by her master. Exactly. So, which is actually insane for Islamic law. Because in Islamic law, your identity, in terms of your name and your religion, come from your father. Why does slavery come from the mother? It, it's not in the Quran, it's not in the Sunnah of the Prophet. And the president of the prophet. This is just an ex something that Muslims adopt because this is part of the. So this, I mean, you could go. I could go on for hours about all the. Now, it's also very important to remember that Islamic law, from the beginning, from the time of the grand of the prophet, there's no debate on this, makes huge changes. So, debt slavery, none. S giving yourself into slavery, none. Enslaving children, none. Enslaving uh, non-Muslims who are living under Muslim rule, none. Uh, enslaving someone as a punishment for crime, none. Like, uh, the, um, the major routes into slavery, not only in the Near East and the Roman world, but in the global history, things like debt, uh, these are prohibited. Now, it doesn't mean that in some parts of the Islamic world they don't exist, especially Southeast Asia and South Asia, but Sharia-wise, it's not allowed. Um, and there's very little disagreement on that, even amongst kind of Western scholars who are looking for disagreement amongst other Muslims. So there's a huge, there's a, a, I mean, another, probably the biggest change that Islamic law introduces is that um, a child born of a male owner and his female slave is free, is legitimate, and has the same social standing as a child born of a free wife, which is unprecedented as far as I know. And so there were all sorts of, I mean, almost all the Abbasid caliphs and almost all the Ottoman sultans, except for one were all children of concubines, slave concubines. And because your slave concubine might be from India, Africa, Greece, uh, Slavic, whatever, Berber, um, the Ottoman sultans were, by the end of the sultanate, probably 99.99, you know, genetic material was not Turkish at all. Uh, and you could have someone who was phenotypically black, but who was in fact born a free child of a free high class master and just happens to be that their mother was African. And that person would have the same social standing as someone who was born of a free you know, white Muslim woman. Uh, so what, what I think is interesting about your, you know, when you talk about slavery in world history, there's huge, I mean, there's debates about whether you can talk about slavery as one thing at all, and then if you are, well, how do you define it, and then if your definition work and how many assumptions are you building into that? And is it just a Western rejection, et cetera, et cetera? 
But the odd thing is, when you're talking about Islam and the Western tradition, actually you can have, it's one conversation, because it's very much within that Roman law tradition. Okay, so if you were to have to divide up the world then in terms of history of slavery, would you say it was a kind of a Western Eurasian, Northwestern Eurasian tradition, and then there are perhaps other traditions? Well, I would say that, that it's to. Paul, Paul Lovejoy talks about this a bit, and I kind of build on his idea of the classic slavery zone. So if you looked in terms of law and practice, not just law, but also practice, you looked sort of North Africa, across the Middle East, into Iran, and Northern India, you'd see very similar ideas, in the sense that you'd have, um, like, if, if you go into South South Asia, or Southeast Asia, you don't, you have much more of this tiered system, where there's not free and slave, there's lots of different sets. And, you you know, it's only like a European colonial person coming in and be like, okay, okay, I need free and I need slave, so I'm just going to shoehorn all these things into free and all these things into slave. Whereas if you look in that classic slavery zone, one way or the other, you're going to have a free slave distinction. And that's actually a big deal. And it's not, it's a legal distinction. It's not kind of um, African, sub-Saharan African societies. You might have this more of an idea of a slave as a marginal person. It's not a hierarchical thing. In society, it's more of a vertical thing where you have a core kind of enfranchised groups that are core and then these marginal groups on the side and that's where slaves exist on the margins, not underneath. So I think, but in the kind of what he calls classic slavery zone, which would go from North Africa into Northern India, you're, you're, I think you would have the same conversation, one conversation. Okay. I don't want to take any more time. But interest, very, uh, very interesting question. Um, uh, death, the question about death penalty prison. So the, the, the issue with, the thing that's unique about slavery and doesn't work for a lot of these other topics you're asking about is that um, the Quran never says, you know, go take a slave. The, the prophet never says, you know, it's really good for you to go take a slave. So it's not required. It's probably not even <coughs> recommended. So if you take, you know, Rajiv and, and Mandu, it's not required in Islam, it's not recommended in Islam, it's just allowed. When something's just allowed, it's very easy to prohibit. If, if I were to say, for example, uh, uh, Shahriar, I prohibit you to pray. <coughs> if I'm the ruler, not only can I not do that, but I've actually become a kafir, and you can, even the most quiet to Sunni can now say, I'm going to rebel and overthrow you. If I say to you, you have to drink alcohol, if I say to you, you have to take off your hijab, these things I can't, because these are required or recommended or whatever. Um, so, things like the Hadood punishments, or uh, the option, so that if, if I murder, if somebody murders somebody else, that person's family, or the state, if they don't have a family, can choose the option of executing that murder. They can choose to take a compensation payment, or they can choose to forgive the person. But, um, to say, so I could maybe... Uh, and this has happened at some points in Islamic history, I could, let's say, restrict your right to execute the person. But I couldn't take away your right to get the compensation payment. So, uh, well, these other things we're talking about are more, they're directly mandated by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, and so they're, it's much, much, much harder to argue for prohibiting them. <coughs> Does that answer your question? If you're interested in the issue of Hadood, read my article on Hadood in yaqeeninstitute.com. It's called Stoning and Handcutting. Uh, this will answer all your questions on that. If you want a question of apostasy, read my article on apostasy. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have time, I guess, for a couple more. Okay. Yes. Um, my, my question maybe is like a follow-up to this. Or just, I would say, um, a secret and that is just now, I mean, um, that is, um, slavery is allowed in Islam. But um, the one, I mean, um, emancipation is the major objective of the Sharia, it's clear. So are the two not contradictory? Or should we understand it as a soft approach of Islam to the, to the issue of slavery? That is. Actually, the ultimate aim is emancipation of human beings, but it's not legally prohibited in Islam. But Islam encourages good treatment of slaves. Yeah. And also, I mean, many 
uh, instances to free your state by encouraging um, the investigation of states. So in this way, I mean, the, 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 the problem of slavery will gradually disappear, or it gradually disappear, I suppose, in Muslim society. <coughs> because, I mean, at least the number of states will lessen, and they are treated very humanely. So can we understand it as a soft approach, can we say, of Islam to solve the problem of slavery? And that is, and, and I'll say that, I mean, um, as we understand it, Islam teaches us the equality of every human being. So I'm just... Okay, I understand. Okay, okay. other more questions? Any a small comment, actually. Uh, I heard that the child born to a master and a slave owner. Not only is free, but the child also benefits the mother. <coughs> that is wrong. Mother will also be free. This is what I mean. Yeah, the, uh, when the master dies, the mother will be free. And he can't, at least in Sunni Islam, he's not allowed to sell uh, the mother in any point. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, would you like to? Uh, oh, we're still on. Okay. Just a short question. Uh, kind of, you, you mapped out this kind of uh, six options of different like discourses about arguing, right? Um, about this abolition, uh, abolition of slavery. What I'm interested in is not a little bit kind of uh, the constellation of these discourses, but in terms of the hierarchy. So my question is, which one among them became dominant within the history of Islam, arguing back with the West, and probably, even if it's there's still some sort of discourse uh, today, which one, which position has come to assume an authoritative and the most ultimate, or the predominant, or the most popular one? Okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, as I said, the Quran and Sunnah are unprecedentedly adamant about emancipation. Now, the issue is that, as I said before, uh, humans had not conceptualized abolition prior to the early on. It would be like me trying to abolish like chairs or something like that, or sitting down, or walking, or working. It wouldn't make sense to them. Um, so even you know, if you watch a movie like Spartacus or something, this is just dripping with historical inaccuracy. Uh, Spartacus and his no pre-modern slave rebellion had the objective of ending slavery even in their region. They just didn't want to be slaves. They, they took their own slaves from other people who made them their slaves. They just didn't want to be slaves. So it would be like, you know, I don't want to end, you know, people don't want to end work. They just don't want to have a job. They don't like that kind of thing. So like, you imagine like that. Um, so, but this um, emancipation is... It doesn't, it doesn't lead to a gradual ending of slavery in Islamic civilization. In fact, one could argue that the drive to emancipate, so Muslims are like on an emancipation treadmill. I mean, this is, I mean, they're really like, I mean, for example, like Mensa Musa, this famous king of Mali who does Hajj in the, the early 1300s and has so much world with him, you know, depresses the gold market in Cairo for like two decades or something like that, right? I mean, in terms of Mansa Musa, right? Um, supposedly the richest human being in history. He has, he manumates a slave every day as a good deed. But what that means is he has a lot of slaves. So he, he's, he's buying slaves all the time so he can manumate slaves. And so, uh, and so Muslims are always manumating slaves, which means they need new slaves. So Islamic civilization is like you know, I have this thing that's like a vacuum cleaner of human beings, just like just sucking in people because they're constantly manumitting people. And uh, now the argument of Muslim scholars is yes, but this is this is good. We're taking people who are living out in the Siberian steppe or Russian steppe or something like that, uh, and you know, or jungles in Africa, and we're bringing them into the world of Islam. And it's a similar argument used by Christians in uh, defense of slavery in the world. Mm -hmm. um, now, today, that argument is not an appealing argument to make. 
Uh, but my point here is that um, obsession, laudable obsession with emancipation, is not <coughs> is not a guaranteed or necessary route to either a diminution or a gradual decline or a gradual ending of slavery. A uh, true um, Islamic law requires uh, good treatment of slaves, uh, but when we when we talk about the kind of moral test of the kind of modern abolitionist consensus of trans-historical condemnation of slavery as a universal evil. Uh, the emancipation turbine doesn't meet that. In fact, it might even uh, lead to more enslavement, which would be kind of un unacceptable by this standard, this map, and the abolitionist consensus standard. That is the argument that to this <coughs> Mm -hmm. This holds. I mean, one of the arguments is that I mean, God yeah. wants. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's it derail. De that's that is one of the arguments. That's one of the options um, that I gave, um, and that you know that might uh, that might be true in the sense that you could read the Quran, you could read the Sunnah of the Prophets, and in fact, especially if you look at the early companions, the companions of the first generation Muslim were actually much more serious about emancipation than later Muslims. <laughs> they are even, you know, I talked about some of these detailed Islamic law that are almost absurd, like, you know, if I say you're free after this, then it's free. Um, uh, the early Muslims, companions and successors, are like, almost, uh, they almost got to the point of ridiculousness in their desire to emancipate. Um, and then that kind of tailors off as Muslims kind of come to terms with the reality of the, the Near Eastern world that they come into. Uh, so you, you're, that argument that you know, it should have ended but it didn't, there's some weight to that. But as I said, the problem, the downside is that, that then you are saying that all the kind of moral thinking about this issue and legal thinking about this issue after that is uh, essentially, uh, you know, it's it's flawed in its structure, in its, in its DNA, from that early period. It's all uh, wrong. It has a, a, a strain of, of misguidance in it. Now, and then, um, I respond to other questions. Which is the most popular? So, the, I should say that one of the things that is part of all of these arguments is that um, slavery in Islam is not like slavery in America. That's like the, and by the way, to get to your, one of your questions that you, I didn't answer is, um, Ottoman diplomats and kind of uh, courtiers who are talking to British delegates and stuff like that in the 1840s, they, they're legitimately confused about why these Europeans are comparing elite slavery in Istanbul with plantation slavery in America. They're just like, what are you talking about? You know, what are you, like, I'm a slave and I'm super rich. You know, and I'm like, my life is great. And you're comparing me to this guy in the field who's being talked about like he's, a, like he's an animal. Uh, so they were legitimately confused about that. But what that they didn't acknowledge was the route by which slaves came into the empire, into the Ottoman Empire, was through a slave trade that was fairly brutal. I mean, it was, it was undeniably brutal. Uh, so... The, the, one of the, the, the thing you find in all the arguments is that Islamic slavery is, uh, it's not really slavery, uh, slavery is not an appropriate word for it, because when you use that word you think of American slavery, which is harsh, it's racist, it's degradating, etc., etc. Um, um, and this is, you, you find in the very earliest Muslim interactions with Westerners on this issue. And they'll say things like, there's this one Algerian former slave dealer talking to a French general in 1830, and he says, um, you not only are our slaves part of our families, we honor them, we free them, we, they're still part of our life, we protect them, but you Europeans, you go and you have sex with the maid, and then the child is a bastard, and it's a disgrace, and everyone has to keep quiet. For us, this is wonderful. You, this is a free child. It's a child just like your other children, and the woman is going to be freed after you. After you. <coughs> uh, but in terms of the, the options that are the most, I think, widely cited are one, um, that Islam intended the ending of slavery, and there they're kind of 
blurring or not getting into the distinction between option two and three sort of it should have ended but didn't end. It's just, and it's and abolition is name of the Sharia. Uh, those two are, are very common. I think those are the most common. Mm -hmm. I guess that was it. Uh, yes. However, <laughs> I want to exercise the chair's prerogative. Yes, exercise. <laughs> um, so this idea of and the modern discourse of slavery being a transhistorical moral evil, absolute, right? Um, how, how, uh, have, not having read the book yet, I, I, maybe you address this, but one of the greatest moral victories uh, in the Quran and also in the biblical tradition is the emancipation of the Israelites from Egypt, right? Uh, and this is the this is overcoming one of the greatest evils. Pharaoh is the embodiment of wickedness. Um, so how can how can slavery in that context? How can slavery not be a transhistorical, uh, absolute moral evil? I have an e easy answer. Please. The Quranic description does not talk about the Israelites that was certainly as slaves. They said. Remember when you were mustadafin fil ard? So they're they're mustadafin fil ard. They are the oppressed of the land. That's the same way that the Muslims are talked about in God talked about the Muslims in Mecca. Mm -hmm. So the Muslims in Mecca are like the Jews in Egypt, mm -hmm. but they're not slaves. They are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so when Shariati or Khomeini, Khomeini right, when they talk about the, 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 the Muslims, the third world, the global south, right, they, they use that same language of a Musta Zafin right? So they, they're drawing the, the imagery, the Quranic and Islamic imagery of the, exo, of the um, exodus, and that is not, a, is not a story of emancipation, it's a story of, of victory over oppression and rescue from oppression. Which so there's a nuance between yeah. that and the biblical tradition, yeah. and and that would also apply perhaps to the African America, the African slaves in the Americas who were oppressed. So I mean that's that's an interesting question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean I think that um, I mean when you when you when your idiom is that of slavery, mm -hmm. you that's going to come up in a lot of discussions where oppression might not come up. And the two, the two are going to appear, like those idioms will appear naturally in different sets of discussions. There's probably an overlap as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know, like, that's a, that's a good question about whether or not kind of African-American Muslim thinkers uh, use this language of Mustazafi for themselves in the Americas. I think it wouldn't surprise me because if you're talking about the global south or the third world, the colonized world, right, um, then sort of the enslaved underclass who might actually not be slaves anymore but are still uh, not equal citizens or subject to an oppressive legal system or a criminal justice system that continues slavery by other names like that 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 uh, idiom of oppression is much more um, uh, accessible and, uh, and kind of fungible than saying everybody's like, slave. Right, so oppression is actually more inclusive. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's a wider circle. Easier. But it's easier. Could, it could include some forms of slavery. Uh, I think. I mean, I imagine so. Yeah. So in that case, there could be. I'm sorry, we're having a conversation. Um, it could be that there's. Uh, well, which is not acceptable in, by the modern standard, yeah. modern global standard. But there are some forms of slavery which are bad, and some forms of slavery which are good. Well, I think this is one of the. You know, and I talk about this a lot. Well, you know. If you say that slavery is a cer has certain definitions, especially if they're very legal definitions, right? If someone is not free, someone has property, uh, you could have things like freedom and property are just incredibly amorphous concepts. So you could have someone who is not free in property and is the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire and worth 80 million gold ducats and married to the daughter of the Sultan and the richest, most powerful man in the empire. And that happened a lot with Ottoman. They were all, all the Ottoman ministers, at least through the 1700s, were slaves of the Sultan. Uh, and to say that that guy is in the same category as some person slaving on a cotton field in Georgia um, with no hope for anything in their life except misery and toil, I mean, are you really having, is this really kind of worthy? Only, it only makes sense as one discussion if you think of something like freedom as being 
in and of itself so wonderful and important that it doesn't matter how rich you are or how powerful you are. If you're not free, or it doesn't matter. But I think that's really a, an imposition of um, a kind of that, that sort of valorization and prioritization of goods is, is, is an imposition that we would be making on people in the world. Let them speak for what they want. Right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, please, again, join me in thank thanking you. Professor Crowley. take this time uh, again to thank all of you for coming and to inform you of the details of the other events uh, at which Professor Brown is going to be speaking. So um, tomorrow afternoon, let me just make sure I have the information correct. Uh, so we'll have a, a formal academic lecture um, on the logic of Islamic law and its transformation in modernity. And that will take place tomorrow um, at 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. And the location is Lecture Theater Number 2 at uh, Lee Shaoqi Building uh, here on the CUHA campus. Um, so if you're available, please come and join us for that as well. And then in addition to that, on um, Sunday, uh, Professor Brown will also be speaking at the uh, Masjid uh, Omar at the at an Islamic Center of Wan Chai, which uh, topic will be Human Rights, Islamic and Western Perspectives, mm -hmm. and this, as I said, will be at uh, Masjid Amr um, at 2.30 p.m., 2.30 p.m. until 5 p.m. on the sixth floor of the Islamic Center in Wanchai. Okay, so I hope to be able to see you again soon, very soon, and uh, thank you very much again for your, uh, for your coming.